the Nile, the world's longest river, a 7,000 kilometer lifeline for almost 400 million people. Flowing north, the Nile runs through 10 countries, from the highlands in the heart of Africa to the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. A source of sustenance, but also one of tension, even potential conflict. The Nile is the key to a geopolitical rivalry in the region. At its heart is Egypt, where suspicions about former enemies and tensions with an age-old civilization reveal deep-seated fears about water scarcity and losing control of the River Nile. Alexandria, Egypt's main city on the Mediterranean. Here, in March 1903, the founder of political Zionism disembarked on a special mission. Theodor Herzl's goal was to secure a homeland for the Jews. One year earlier, he had petitioned for such a homeland to be allowed in Palestine, then part of the Ottoman Empire. The request was rejected by Sultan Abdul Hamid II. So, Herzl took a contingency plan to Egypt, a country then under British occupation. Some British officials floated the idea, and Herzl even initially toyed with the idea of accepting a small temporary Jewish um, entity, Zionist entity, in northern Sinai around El Arish. The Zionists said, well, it's a step from there to Palestine, so it brings us closer to the homeland. The plan involved a first phase settlement in the Sinai of some 20,000 Jewish immigrants, to be followed by successive numbers to total 100,000. There was plenty of space in the Sinai Desert, but the area lacked one basic element of life, water. Herzl, however, proposed a remarkable solution to divert some of the Nile waters to the desert region. This settlement was going to need water. Herzl's plan was for the water to be carried from a branch of the Nile via eight pipelines under the Suez Canal. The water would then travel over 150 kilometers to the settlement. The British High Commissioner in Egypt, Lord Cromer, rejected Herzl's proposal. Egypt, at that time, was the main source of cotton for the British textile industry. Irrigation engineers warned that diverting the Nile waters would damage Egypt's cotton production and therefore affect British economic interests. The idea for a Jewish homeland in the Sinai was never implemented. But over 70 years later, plans to divert the Nile waters re-emerged. In November 1977, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat arrived at Tel Aviv's Ben-Gurion airport. The visit marked the start of peace negotiations between Sadat and the Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin. Israel was in a strong bargaining position, occupying the Sinai, Jerusalem, the West Bank, Gaza and the Golan Heights. Sadat wanted the Arab land back, but had fewer bargaining chips. He definitely wanted a comprehensive peace, uh, but I think two things uh, affected the, the, the result. Begin followed a very devious policy through castrating, through castrating, time, 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 time. And Prince Sadat was 
under pressure. In the ongoing negotiations, Sadat, aware of Israel's water needs, knew he held at least one strong card, the River Nile. In December 1979, the Egyptian magazine October, known to be a mouthpiece for Sadat, published a sensational report. The headline on the front page read, The Nile to Reach Jerusalem. The article reported that Sadat had ordered blueprints prepared for the construction of a canal to carry the Nile waters to Israel in exchange for a comprehensive peace agreement in the Middle East. Well, there were these dreams about, you know, Egyptian-Israeli cooperation and, and peace that will be prevailed in this region. And, you know, people thought that uh, there are no limits. So some people start thinking in these terms, you know, that the Nile should be used for uh, Sinai Peninsula and maybe also to Israel. To the friendship between the people of Egypt and the peoples of, Is of Israel. The two countries made peace, but any plan to divert the Nile to Israel never materialized. To this day, many Egyptians believe the reported offer was more a negotiating ploy than a meaningful proposition. This was a good trick played by Sadat. He gave the Israelis false hope in order to secure the signing of the peace accord. But he never planned to implement the Nile offer. But the Nile waters were eventually diverted. In January 1997, Sadat's successor, Hosni Mubarak, officially opened a tunnel carrying Nile waters under the Suez Canal. The waters flowed into the so-called Peace Canal, extending into the Sinai. Some Egyptians suspected Israel might be the ultimate destination of the canal. At the inauguration ceremony, Mubarak seemed to address such suspicions. <laughs> Today, the Peace Canal runs 80 kilometers eastwards into Sinai. It allows for the irrigation and development of farmland reclaimed from the desert. The idea of diverting the Nile to the Sinai, first proposed by Theodor Herzl, is now a reality. Just 115 kilometers from the end of the canal and across Egypt's international border is the Negev Desert. Forming over half of Israel's total land area, the Negev is a land thirsty for water. The Israelis have sought to manage their limited water sources and deny the need for the extension of the Peace Canal, saying it would be surplus to requirement. If you are talking about the relation between the Nile and Israel, there are no such relations, and we don't see uh, that we are going to use this water in the future. We solve our own problems in the Negev, in the south, uh, with no connection with the Nile. Faced with a water shortage and keen to reclaim the desert, Israel has needed to find innovative solutions. Israel is the world leader in efficient water use in agriculture, more crop per drop, using the, say, the drip irrigation, other technologies and techniques, and the technologies that are here are being utilized elsewhere, India, China, South America, Africa, wherever you go, you will find Israeli technology basically used in agriculture. Israel's ambassador to Kenya, Jacob Kaida, arrives to a warm welcome from local farmers in the village of Gorati on the outskirts of Nairobi. He's clear on his assignment. 
the idea, the basic idea is to assist uh, communities of farmers to achieve much more yield, much more crops with less labor, with less water, and uh, even with less uh, fertilizers and pesticides. These women farmers are beneficiaries of this assistance. By passing on its know-how and donating equipment, Israel is empowering local communities in Africa and winning friends. We are so impressed with them because they are genuine friends who go right down to see the needs of the people. And so for us in this village, we are very happy with them. But others in Africa believe Israel's presence there, particularly in upstream Nile countries like Kenya, has more to do with politics than aid. <laughs> Israel is not a charity. It seeks to harm Egypt. There is nothing new in that. It's the nature of Israeli politics. And if it didn't operate in that way, then it would not be Israel. Since its establishment in 1948, surrounded by hostile Arab neighbors, Israel has sought friends where it can. In Africa, Israel built relations with newly independent non-Arab states. Egypt grew increasingly concerned about Israel's activities on the continent. They suspected the Israelis of trying to politically outflank Egypt by befriending countries that could influence the flow of Egypt's lifeline, the River Nile. Historically, the most important relationships Israel built on the African continent were with Uganda, Ethiopia and Kenya. And it's no coincidence that all of them are upstream countries where the Nile originates. They did build relationships with other countries, but the River Nile was the major factor behind the formation of Israeli policy and strategy. President Nasser of the United Arab Republic arrives in style by yacht for the summit meeting in Morocco of neutralist African leaders. But Israel faced tough competition for friends in Africa. Egyptian President Jamal Abdel Nasser was also building allies of his own in the region. His struggle for independence and non-alignment resonated with many Africans. In 1963, Egypt became one of the founding member states of the Organization of African Unity. Following the 1967 war, the organization condemned Israel's occupation of parts of Egypt and other Arab countries and demanded the withdrawal of Israeli troops from all occupied Arab territories. The African view of Israel as a small, struggling country that posed no threat began to change. Israel was very weak at that point and clearly it couldn't do anything about uh, Egyptian role in Africa. Shortly after the Arab-Israeli war in October 1973, the majority of African countries severed relations with Israel. Nasser's successor, Anwar Sadat, failed to capitalize on Africa's strategic shift away from Israel. Sadat didn't want to just follow in Nasser's footsteps, he wanted to blaze his own trail. He chose to focus on building relations with the West and securing peace with Israel. He turned his back on the Pan-African policies Nasser had pursued. Egypt once played a commanding role in Africa, but in the 1970s, Egypt neglected this role. This resulted in the withdrawal of Egypt's presence in Africa. Countries there started to think Egypt had abandoned them. Husni Mubarak 
followed a similar strategy to his predecessor. In 1995, an event took place that would set the seal on Mubarak turning away from Africa. In June of that year, arriving in the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa to attend an African summit, Mubarak's motorcade was ambushed by Islamist militants here on the airport road. Mubarak's bulletproof car saved his life. His bodyguard shot dead the gunman. Following this attack, and for the rest of his term in office, Mubarak chose to send ministers or delegates to African summits, rather than attending himself. Egypt's friends in the region believe this presidential absence was a strategic error, allowing Israel to once again gain a political foothold in Africa. As a poet once said, gentlemen, our enemies did not break through our borders. Instead, they crawled like ants through our weaknesses. By the 1990s, many of the upstream Nile Basin countries had re-established diplomatic relations with Israel and reopened their embassies in Tel Aviv. Today, Israel is building on these relations. Here, on the outskirts of Tel Aviv, these trainees from Africa are learning innovative agricultural techniques to take back to their countries. Training is sponsored by the Center for International Cooperation, known as Mashav, part of Israel's foreign ministry. But we are focusing, and most of our work is really in, in Africa, probably about 40% uh, of our resources, and mostly is uh, uh, towards uh, food security, agriculture, and water-related issues. Beyond training programs in Israel, Mashav also takes its aid overseas. Back in the Kenyan village of Garati, women farmers grow fresh produce in a greenhouse donated by Mashav. The greenhouse, which enables the women to earn a living, was officially donated to them by Israeli Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman. Lieberman arrived in Africa in September 2009. At the head of a large entourage, he visited five African states, including three of the upstream Nile Basin countries, Kenya, Uganda and Ethiopia. The minister came with a big economic delegation, representatives of more than 20 of the biggest Israeli companies. We had business seminars with them, business meetings, and we see a very, very big follow-up uh, in terms of uh, business deals and uh, uh, opportunities for investments. Lieberman was the first Israeli foreign minister to go on an African tour since the 1960s. Thank you for coming. The sight of Lieberman making friends and doing deals in the Nile upstream countries aroused concern in Egypt. Egyptians were once again worried the Israelis were meddling in their backyard, in a region holding the source of the Nile. The African countries Lieberman visited dismissed Egyptian suspicions, stating the visit was strictly business. We look to Africa to help. Israel is uh, not dictating uh, the will of uh, uh, Ethiopian uh, government. Foreign minister has uh, paid uh, uh, a visit. He came here not to ask the uh, government to reduce uh, the water Nile to Egypt. Simply, this is a government to government uh, business, nothing else. But Egyptian fears were not so easily appeased. Lieberman's visit coincided with a particularly tense point in Egypt's talks with the other Nile Basin countries to reach a new agreement over managing the Nile waters. 
Egyptian suspected Israel was behind the renewed pressure Egypt faced to make concessions. Israel has had a clear strategy since it was established. So it focuses on having a presence in the upstream Nile countries to create problems for Egypt on the issue of water, to encircle Egypt and create internal difficulties. Because if Egypt has a water crisis, then it will have a development problem and a national security issue. It will not be able to guarantee a better life for Egyptians and therefore it will be preoccupied with internal problems. That is Israel's goal. For their part, Israelis reject such notions that they are plotting with African states to outmaneuver Egypt. Uh, I think this is another one of those Arab conspiracy theories, which uh, unfortunately there are so many of them going around. Sometimes, you know, I, I can't stop myself laughing from, from what I read in, in Arab internet sites about all kinds of conspiracies. Uh, which uh, describe us, the Israelis, as demons and people who, uh, who come up with scenarios that uh, the, the craziest screenwriters in Hollywood couldn't even think about. In early 2011, Egyptians took to the streets in open revolt against the government of Hosni Mubarak. On February the 11th, Egypt's vice president announced Mubarak's resignation from power, ending 30 years of rule. Egyptians were exultant. Their complaints had been many. Among them was criticism of Mubarak's failure to engage in constructive diplomacy with the other African states along the Nile. Egypt has been absent from this arena. These 10 states are supposed to be members of the same family, the offspring of one mother, which is the River Nile. They are like brothers, sharing the same lifeline. We should have engaged with them rather than with the US, Europe, or Asia. These states should be the closest to us because they share the same life and the same fate. Significantly, the first foreign trip of Egypt's new prime minister after the 2011 revolution was to Sudan. Issam Sharaf led a high-profile delegation of Egyptian ministers. The visit signaled a new diplomatic drive for Egypt in the Nile Basin. But the struggle over the Nile will not easily be resolved. It goes back thousands of years. Egypt and another of Africa's oldest civilizations seemed to be locked into an increasingly bitter river rivalry. Ethiopia. The Blue Nile flows on its long journey towards Sudan and Egypt. The Ethiopians call the Blue Nile the Abai, a word carrying a sense of reverence and adoration. The name of Abai is big, father. It's a fatherly, the resource that provides, that is very heavy, very respected, revered from Ethiopian side. Ajiben Shabibi lives in the village of Zom Amba, close to the Abai, or Blue Nile. With a family of nine to support, Ajiben collects firewood, the sole source of energy. We don't have electricity. 
My hair has turned from black to gray living in this land. We just burned this wood and some kerosene for light during the night. For Ajibench, like more than 80% of Ethiopians, the very thought of a light bulb is a dream. I will celebrate. I don't know when I'm meant to die. But for so long I've been burning wood. And if I get light with just a click, I will die a happy person. The Nile could help realize the dreams of Ethiopians like Ajibench. Harnessing the fast-flowing river, descending from the Ethiopian highlands, would generate electricity, reducing the country's chronic power shortage. But to date, the full potential of the river remains untapped. Decades of civil unrest and war have hindered Ethiopia's ability to develop. Instead, it remains one of the world's poorest countries. Meles Zenawi assumed power in 1991. He champions himself as the builder of a new Ethiopia. Billboards around the capital Addis Ababa herald a brighter future with the construction of dams and hydroelectric power stations. The projects will, quite literally, bring power to the people. One of uh, the big resources we have in Ethiopia is uh, hydro. Mm -hmm. So the government has an intention to develop uh, up to 10,000 megawatt within the coming five years. Beneath these hills is the Tana Beles hydro power station. This tunnel will divert the Nile waters over turbines to generate power. The station will eventually produce over 400 megawatts of electricity annually, reducing Ethiopia's power deficit by 30%. The water exits from tunnels to continue on its way downstream. No water is taken out of the river, a point the Ethiopians are particularly keen to stress. So now what we are doing here is we are diverting that water. So we are not changing anything of any operation of the lake or uh, the river. The Tana Beles station does not affect the Nile's discharge. This is the crucial factor. Egyptians say they would regard any attempt to reduce the Nile flow to their country as a hostile act. So, Ethiopia treads a fine line between exploiting the Nile for its own development while not incurring the wrath of its downstream Nile neighbors. We are here to develop dams not to reduce or not to damage uh, their needs. We are uh, going to utilize for our economic development uh, as well because uh, Ethiopia is a poor country now trying to come out from uh, that poverty by utilizing its resources. Nile is one of our resources. Despite Ethiopian assurances, Egypt is concerned about any reduction in its sole source of water. A 1929 agreement between Egypt and Britain, the colonial power at the time, gave Egypt a veto power on any project upstream that would affect or decrease the amount of water reaching Egypt. Egyptians are keen to ensure this agreement is upheld. 
لتنظيم إيراد النهر. Egypt needs to manage the river's discharge. The agreement states there must be prior notification. This must be adhered to. According to international laws governing the use of rivers running through many countries, upstream states can use the waters on the condition they don't harm the downstream countries. You are obliged to notify me, to notify Egypt, so my interests are not harmed. You can satisfy your interests, but just don't harm mine. But Egyptian interests were challenged. Your Excellency is here with me is the agreement on the Nile River Basin Cooperative Framework. In May 2010, at a meeting of Nile Basin countries in the Ugandan city of Entebbe, six upstream states, including Ethiopia, signed a new Nile agreement. The agreement enables upstream countries to implement irrigation and hydropower projects without Egypt being able to exercise the veto power it was given by the 1929 agreement. Egypt will not be able to stop Ethiopia from building dams on the Nile. That is history, and that is not going to be part of the solution. Ethiopia is able and willing to use its own resources to build dams on the Nile. The way forward is not for Egypt to try and stop the unstoppable. The prospect of upstream countries building dams alarms Egyptians, especially if that country happens to be Ethiopia. Only 15% of the Nile waters reaching Egypt originate in the Great Lakes region. Yet, 85% come from the Ethiopian highlands, from three main tributaries, the Sabat, Blue Nile, and the Atbara. Any dam built in Ethiopia would pose a serious threat to Egypt's water supply. The likelihood of such a scenario is creating tension between the two countries. The transparency and consultation was not happening between the two countries, might be because of, because of suspicion, because of some unknown fear, I think. But uh, this unknown fear can only be from the Egyptians, because the water is coming from here, from Ethiopia. Such antagonism is exacerbated by a long history of rivalry. Egypt, the land of the pyramids, and the ancient civilization of the pharaohs. Ethiopia, a land described as the birthplace of mankind, and the domain of great emperors who ruled the country for centuries. Acrimony between these two civilizations has always been centered on the Nile. The rivalry dates back some 3,000 years to the times of Ethiopian Emperor Menelik I. Emperor Menelik I of Ethiopia used to threaten Egypt, saying that he would divert the course of the Nile to the Red Sea, away from the Mediterranean. These threats were made, and all the rulers of Egypt, from the time of the pharaohs, used to send gifts and gold to the emperor to stop him from diverting the Nile. Religious differences have added to the historical tensions. In the fourth century, Ethiopia became a Christian nation, making it one of the oldest Christian states in the world. From the seventh century, Egypt emerged as the heart of the Arab and Islamic world. As the two countries adopted different faiths, power politics over the Nile continued down through history. 
فلما جاء محمد علي By the time Muhammad Ali began to rule Egypt in 1805, many threats had been made by the Ethiopian emperors to stop the water reaching Egypt. Most were just empty threats, but some were valid. Every time there was a new ruler in Egypt, they would threaten him and blackmail him so that he paid gold to the Ethiopian emperor. Muhammad Ali considered how to eliminate this threat, which was damaging to Egypt's prestige. Muhammad Ali's response was to expand Egypt's borders southwards to command the headwaters of the Nile. In 1820, he conquered the territories, today known as Sudan. For the first time, Egyptians and Ethiopians were now face to face across a common border. In the 1870s, Muhammad Ali's grandson, Khediv Ismail, continued his grandfather's expansionist policy, seeking to increase the size of his realm over the course of the Nile. Khediv Ismail tried to conquer Ethiopia. He dispatched a large army. He thought it would be an easy mission, but he failed. The Egyptian army was crushed in 1876 and had to retreat. The rivalry between Egypt and Ethiopia continued into the next century. By the 1950s, it had taken on a more personal dimension. Despite the smiles and handshakes, the two countries were led by two larger-than-life leaders with two differing political visions. Egypt's president, Jamal Abdel Nasser, was a revolutionary ideologue of anti-imperialism. Ethiopian emperor Haile Selassie was a monarch embodying imperial governance. Both men saw themselves as Africa's primary leader. There's been a lot written on Ethiopia because it's a country with a great civilization, like Egypt. And so there was always a feeling that it was equal to Egypt. But Egypt was always more important. Ethiopians never had the same role. In 1959, Egypt and Sudan agreed on dividing the river's waters. Ethiopia was neither invited to the negotiations nor included in the agreement. That Ethiopia was not included was a big mistake. But Ethiopia made it sure that having also known that such a deal was going on, and Ethiopia was very much opposed to that exclusionist policy. In the 1970s, political changes in each country raised tensions further. Egypt's new president, Anwar Sadat, abandoned both the leftist ideas of his predecessor and relations with the Soviet Union. Instead, he turned to the West. Egypt's new political leaning was endorsed by an official visit from US President Richard Nixon, who received a rapturous welcome in Cairo in June 1974. Ironically, a few months later, Ethiopia would go through a political turnaround of its own. In September 1974, Emperor Haile Selassie was overthrown in a military coup which turned Ethiopia into a communist country. The two countries were right back where they started, in a political standoff on different sides of the Cold War. Once again, the River Nile was at the center of this tension. Egypt's relations with the Soviet Union deteriorated. The Soviets, in coordination with Ethiopia, responded by planning to build dams in the Ethiopian highlands to stop or decrease the Nile water flowing to Egypt. President Sadat answered back, saying Egypt would launch a war and destroy any dams built on the Ethiopian plateau that affected the amount of water reaching Egypt. 
Today, the Ethiopians continue, for the time being, to tread the fine line between developing their country and deferring to Egyptian concerns. But this could change. In April 2011, Ethiopian Prime Minister Meles Zanawi announced plans for a new project on the Blue Nile. Called the Grand Millennium Dam, it is forecast to produce over 5,000 megawatts of electricity per year. It will be the largest hydropower station in Africa and will solve Ethiopia's chronic power shortage. Ethiopia is aware of Egyptian concerns. The Ethiopian uh, people and the government is not enemy of uh, Egypt uh, and Egypt's people. So what we are demanding is really to see on a stable basis as the Egyptian government and the politicians are uh, caring for their people and uh, their lives, they have to care also for Ethiopia, as we are already caring for them also. As populations increase and economies develop, demand for the Nile waters is intensifying. The Nile may be the world's longest river, but it carries a relatively small amount of water compared to other rivers around the world. The Nile's annual discharge totals 84 billion cubic meters. This is insufficient for any of the Nile Basin countries. As for Egypt, it's simply not enough. Egypt's need for water is growing greater day by day. The scarcity of water in the Nile Basin is creating fear, suspicion and tension. Such sentiments are exacerbated by the uncertainties of Mother Nature. The Nile is formed from rainfall at its points of origin in the Ethiopian highlands and the Great Lakes region. The gift of nature is proving increasingly erratic. Right now, with the climate change, the weather forecast is unpredictable. Even the so-called rains which we used to have in plenty, it is now no longer regular, it's no longer predictable. Well, I'd say that with higher temperatures, you obviously have the potential, warmer air holds more moisture, you have the potential for bigger downpours. So if that does prove to be the case, then further flooding will be an issue. But there is only a, a limited amount of water out there in the atmosphere. So Flooding in one area will inevitably lead to drought in another. Averting such catastrophe will require cool heads, calm words and regional collaboration. Following the revolution in Egypt in early 2011, Egyptian diplomacy was refocused on the region. We need to cooperate, and they need to cooperate. We want to continue in a mood of consensus, not conflict. Because all the Nile Basin countries are here to stay. No one is going anywhere. There is no basis for fear against each other. There is no reason to fight. And there is no reason that one country monopolizes the water resources, whether in the upstream or downstream. From the Great Lakes of East Africa and the highlands of Ethiopia, through the swamps of the Sud, the arid desert of the Sahara, the fertile valley in Sudan and Egypt flowing out into the Mediterranean Sea. Millions living along the River Nile dream of a better future. It is a natural resource. It is a gift from God. 
and we must all use it well, just like our forefathers. No one living beside the Nile can ever stray from it. If he does, he will feel lost. I've lived long enough. I dream of a better future for my kids. God is sustaining us. God provides. Everything is good. God's blessing is all around us. As long as there is no war and we are living in peace, we sleep easy. I want to continue with my job. I do like it very much. Not this big, but this big. <laughs> The River Nile unites worlds of mountains, jungle, marsh, and desert. But in the man-made world of nation-states, asserting patriotism and politics, the river has become a source of discord. The Nile Basin countries face a stark choice. Set aside fears and tensions and cooperate. Or run the risk of confrontation and conflict. The Nile will endure but a continuing struggle over its waters can only spell ruin for all those who live on the banks of this great river. <laughs>